our principal benefactor, Ms. Priscilla Shaw, member of Board of Trustee, Mr. Edward De Silva, member of Alumni Advisory Board, NUS Senior Management, distinguished alumni, students, and friends. My name is Evelyn. I'm an alumni of the Faculty of Business. Let me share with you briefly the program for today. It has three sessions, and the first is a 10 minutes talk by Professor Tan Cho Chuan, followed by a 10 minutes interview with Viswa Sivan, Chairman of You Alive Organizing Committee. And last but not least is a 40 minutes Q&A session. If you wish to ask a question, please proceed to the mic that's placed along the aisle. Introduce yourself and speak directly into the microphone. This is essential so that the online community is able to hear your question. Thank you for your attention and please sit back and enjoy the session. Thank you. Four years of uh, education cannot prepare you really for a whole lifetime of work and life. They can only set the foundations. But today, the environment has shifted quite a bit. Information is becoming more and more freely accessible, it's pervasive, and uh, the premium placed upon having a body of knowledge is much less. Second, the world is becoming a lot more complex. We are faced with issues every day which cross many different disciplines, many different sectors. We have to focus on the nurturing of critical minds. Minds that can take a mess of information that crosses many different sectors, look at issues, rigorously make sense of them, and yet have imagination and creativity that will look at a body of information but think and look way beyond it to examine not just what it says now but the potential applications and uses for the future. Yes, it does occur. You know, it occurs whether or not we deal with it in university. But university is actually perhaps the best time to learn how to not just appreciate this, but how to deal with this effectively. That's where I think an individual is able to synthesize ideas, bring them together, bridge differences, come up with innovative approaches, would be vastly more effective than someone who just gets caught in all the conflict and is unable to navigate beyond that. <laughs> Professor Tan Cho Chuan. Good evening, colleagues and friends. I want to start by asking a question. Are we ready for the future? Our students and our graduates, are we, as an institution, ready for the future? In education, are we ready for a future where information is increasingly commoditized? We all know that information is now freely available anywhere, anytime. 
In fact, it could be said that each of us has two brains, one in our heads and one in our hands. The one in our hands is called the internet. And in the past, graduates, individuals could distinguish themselves because of a much more superior store of knowledge. But at a time where information is so much more readily available, how do graduates, how do educated people differentiate themselves? How do they bring greater value to the things they see and look at? Are we ready for a future of much greater complexity and speed? In this part of the world, our education still tends to be rather specialized. And yet, most of the problems, the issues that we face every day are increasingly complex. They cross many different disciplines. How do we prepare individuals who will be able to deal with matters of much greater complexity occurring at much higher speed? Are we ready for a future where Asia is increasingly prominent? This seems like a very odd question to ask, because after all, aren't we Asians? Aren't we in the heart of Asia? But if we think about it carefully, do our students, do our graduates, really understand Asia? Do we as an institution have anything special to offer for Asia? Will we be able to remain relevant and to bring value to Asia as it grows and as it confronts its greatest challenges? So these are some of the critical questions which we as educators have to think about as we consider how to shape education for the future. And I think it's very important that the central focus of our education is on the training of the critical mind. It's on the training of the critical mind. And the critical mind has to do, has to be able to do a number of things. The first and possibly most important is sense-making. If two individuals were given the same big set of complicated data, how would one person, how would the NUS graduate see the data in a different way, make sense of it more creatively, develop better solutions? To be able to make sense of masses of data requires a strong foundation of knowledge. So even though information is becoming increasingly commoditized, it does not mean that it replaces the need for each individual to build up a sufficient knowledge base. You need that knowledge base in order to interpret, to curate, to place, and to make sense of data. So as, an educators, as educators, how do we strike the balance between creating that foundation versus and how does it help individuals to think about things much more critically. But making sense of data, in many ways, requires the individual to have what I'll call a zoom out, zooming capability. To look at issues of great complexity, which cross many disciplines, in a sense, you must be able to zoom out so that you see the issues as a whole try to find the connections between different disciplines across different sectors of knowledge. Consider how these things interact and how they may affect the types of solutions that can be obtained. But zooming out is not good enough. You also must be able, when you need to, in a particular area, be able to zoom in. Look at the area with rigor, and analysis so that you'll be able to take the relevant parts of this and add it to the whole picture that you see. So breadth by itself is very important. 
But breath without those elements of rigor and critical thinking is insufficient because then you'll be flitting around. You'll be dealing with things too superficially. So being, being able to zoom out and zoom in is a very critical requirement for the future. But even more difficult than that is that it's not just a matter of analysis, that we also need people who are open to ideas and yet have a sense of imagination that what they see before them today represents the reality of today, but to have the sense of imagination to perceive different outcomes, different possibilities well into the future. Because that sense of imagination is what will drive creative change for the future. Of course, training of the mind is important, but we need to go beyond it, beyond training of the mind to training of the whole person. Values and the personal and inter interpersonal qualities that will enable individuals to succeed and to bring value to their societies. Of course, to do this is going to be a tremendous task. We will have to train and engage teachers, professors, to move away from being the sage on the stage, projecting their knowledge, to become guidance, guardians, guideposts for students. Students have to learn how not to just be passive receptacles of learning, but also to actively engage the materials before them. There are many mindsets that have to be changed. For example, a singular focus on grades may actually detract individuals from developing their minds. And we also have to consider a situation that as our students, as our graduates, as individuals become more critical, they will have to test assumptions. They'll have to re-examine the norms. They will have to think about issues at the boundaries of what society may be comfortable with. And in our Asian context, particularly in Confucian societies, where there's a reverence for age, for order, for hierarchy, there will be a tension. But we can and we must develop this into a constructive tension. And in so doing, perhaps help to contribute to the development of the new discourse, the new education of critical minds in the new Asia. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think the future that we are facing is one which is fraught with challenges. But it's also a future which is full of opportunities. It's full of opportunities for universities like ours to try to develop, to blaze new pathways, to try to find new models in which we can address these challenges, to develop individuals who would be able to succeed and to be leaders, particularly in Asia. But it will be also a great challenge. We will need to engage the entire NUS community in order for us to examine how best we can proceed in a systematic and scalable manner so that in the end, we'll be able to say that the graduates of NUS the NUS as an institution will be ever ready for the future. Thank you. You know, you are a critical mind. <laughs> are you? <laughs> you're critical of my <laughs> mind. <laughs> Do you think you're a critical mind? I think so. Okay. Do you feel that uh, it's surprising that you are a critical mind? in spite of the fact that you emerged from SGI? <laughs> well, I think it's a combination of uh, circumstances uh, beyond the school. Um, I think SGI did provide a certain amount of training, but in many ways it was uh, the university, NUS, as well as my experiences both in university and outside, I think that particularly shaped the way I thought, the way I think, 
and in many ways the way I am today. Now, what I'm quite interested to find out is what you meant when you said four years is too short a time to shape a critical mind. Now, how many of you here agree with that? That four years is indeed too short a time to shape a critical mind from scratch. From scratch. You all don't agree with that? You think that four years is enough, so you disagree with the president. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Four years is impossible to shape a critical mind from scratch, which is the reason why I'm asking you, is it not important for us in the university to also cast the net wider and start thinking about the feeder system, the kind of products that actually come to the university? Because you can't work miracles in four years. Now, do we have the kind of raw critical mind, so to speak, that you can then shape during the four years? Does the system in Singapore allow you to bring in minds that already have formed a certain appreciation for what is critical? I think there are two ways you can look at this. One is that for the students that come into NUS, uh, I do believe that the majority of them, if given the right, the right opportunity, can either develop critical minds or gain enough perception of it so that they can continue to grow. Because this is not a metamorphosis that occurs in university and then stops thereafter. In some cases, students come in already very critical and we can actually help them develop further, basically to develop the rigor, to develop the contextual understanding. There may be others who come in like I did when I came to university from a very sheltered, poor background, but where the introduction to new modes of learning, to new stimuli, enabled me to, to open up and to grow and start on a trajectory that continued way beyond university. And so we should also consider the fact that we can open up people's minds and help them establish a habit of mind mm -hmm. so that they may not emerge from university fully formed, but they have the capacity, they have the desire that with time, they will be able to develop the types of minds that would enable them to succeed in the future. So I think that's one dimension. And as educators, we, I do believe that it's our responsibility to create a condition whereby whatever student we have before us, we have to see what's the best we can do to help them develop to the best that they can. But what you say is also very true, which is what happens upstream. And here, I think, I think there are two issues we should bear in mind. The first is that um, there is a certain line of thinking that uh, the so-called Confucian learning, rote learning, is uh, uh, shallow learning. It uh, doesn't, doesn't promote critical thinking. But there is some emerging data to show that this may not be true. That that way of learning helps build up a certain discipline, a certain habit of mind that then poises you to become very creative and critical thinker in the future. So the so first thing I want to say is that just because uh, rote learning does not express itself in the ways that traditional Western pedagogical study would label as being creative does not mean that it's of no value. But the second part of this is that I do also agree that earlier upstream in the schools, we have to do more in order for students to be able to question. In other words, not just uh, solve problems that have been presented, but to learn how to formulate questions. And the questions at the beginning could be perhaps simpler, but as they become more developed in the course of their studies, the, the level of questioning could be more intense. And at the end of the day, uh, in today's world, a uh, central issue about critical thinking is really the ability to ask the right questions. Because once you 
know the right question to ask, then it's usually quite simple to look for the solutions. The information yeah. is available. But if you are unable to ask the right question, then you don't know where to start. And it's interesting because, okay, you come from SGI. Quite a, quite a few of my friends, I mean, you don't need to apologize for it. Quite a few of my friends uh, who come from SGI, you know, they share with me that they would prefer to send their children to SGI International instead of SGI Independent. And these are people who truly believe in the SGI tradition. Now, as you're aware, SGI International has a diluted SGI brand. It's got an international brand. But yet, they are prepared to compromise their, the importance of tradition because they do feel strongly that SGI International gives their children a stronger foundation to face the challenges of this new brave world. What, is, what do you think accounts for that? What is the difference? And why is it that SGI International is able to charge a huge premium and yet have a long queue awaiting this? What accounts for this? Well, it can't I... be that all the people, all those who are going to SGI International, have lost the plot. Well, I think it's going to be very individual. Uh, the choices which parents make as to where to send the students, uh, their children, would depend very much, I think, on their, should depend quite a bit on the assessment of the character, the strengths and weaknesses of their children, and the kind of environment where they can actually grow, not just intellectually, but as individuals. And uh, I think that one of the factors that could be operating here is that perhaps more of these parents today believe that their children would benefit more from a wider, more global exposure, one which is, in a sense, more cross-cultural, so that their children would become more outgoing, more willing to engage, as opposed to what people might perceive as more passive ways of learning in the traditional I, system. I suspect also, I, I see your point, but I also suspect sometimes that Mm. Quite often, we tend to confuse rigor with rote. Do you think we, we at fault of doing that? Rote and rigor are two different things. They both start with the same letter, but that's where the commonality ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you want to comment on that? Well, I, I think rote is the kind of uh, mindless memorization of things, uh, and I can recount what my Chinese teacher taught me, right, because I'm learning Chinese language now, and he said, just remember all this, it doesn't matter whether you understand it or not. At some point in the future, it'll all make sense to you. I'm sure so, it makes you love the subject. So that's rote, right? So you commit all this to memory, and at some point, it'll make sense to you. Yeah. Rigor is, of course, quite different. Rigor is actually the disciplined, analytical approach by which you intensively look at a topic. And it requires a substantial foundation of knowledge, as well as understanding of methods of inquiry appropriate to the topic. But rigor is very important, because particularly in a world which uh, perhaps has become too broad and where too many things are dis discussed at a very general level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, rigor is required in order to go beyond the obvious, Absolutely. and to be able to understand the complexities of each issue. And I think that rigor then is a foundation for better solutions. So to understand you better, George Wan, basically what you're saying is rigor is more important than rote yes. if, you want to, if you want to develop a critical mind. Because earlier on you talked about the importance of rote, but I would suggest to you that really we are talking about rigor. I know. Uh, by which I meant earlier, that this assumption that rote learning is did not bad. lead to creative minds mm. was bad, I think we need to examine that. Because so long as it's not mindless memorization of things, but the application of the mind to understand issues, to accumulate knowledge, that by itself 
does not diminish the ability to be critical. Yeah. In fact, it enhances it. One quick last question before I throw it open to the floor. You had used the word constructive earlier on in, in your presentation. You said, as long as the critical appraisal is constructive. You know, I've been quite befuddled by the meaning of this word constructive. So let me, let me ask you a question. If you were to say something, for example, something quite preposterous, like SGI is a great school, <laughs> okay? And I don't know why I've got this issue with SGI, you know? <laughs> and I say I completely disagree with that premise. I completely disagree with that. I think what you're saying makes absolutely no sense. Is that constructive? Oh, no. I think that uh, learning how to disagree without being disagreeable yeah. is what I consider part of constructive Agreed. engagement. But right? would disagreeing with the fundamental premise of your argument still make it constructive? No. I, I think uh, there are going to be many areas where individuals would disagree. Very fundamentally, fundament right? Very fundamentally. And uh, that has to be so. Yeah. And I think what is required is an intellectual honesty and openness so that we are not bound by our own ideological biases. So necessarily, people will disagree on fundamental issues. Yeah. But we need to find ways to disagree without being disagreeable. Right. And that the tone of the discourse need not be one adversarial. Yes. Need not be adversarial. Yeah. Because if we are now living in a much closer packed world where cross cultural issues keep coming up much more frequently, you would have to find ways to have differences in views while being able to live and work together. Yeah. And I think that would be the basis by which constructive engagement, a constructive tension between critical thinking and the context of the topic would have to apply. And, and, and I like what you said just now about disag disagreeing without being disagreeable. And the whole point of, of listening as much as you speak. Right. But the reason why I asked you that question is because on a few occasions when I have had discussions with people in positions of authority in our country, the definition of constructive was that you can, you can question aspects of an idea or a policy, but not debunk the policy altogether. If you debunk the policy altogether, it's not constructive. I was just trying to understand whether that's your understanding. Because there may be times when you completely disagree with a proposition. Now, that should not render it. No. And, and the reason why I'm asking this, because if you're trying to, if you, if you're trying to imbue the sense of critical thinking among the students who come into NUS, they still have to exit and go into the real world. And is the real world ready to accept that rigor of constructive discourse. But it's going to happen anyway. Yeah. Whether or not students in NUS learn how to engage constructively or not, this tension already exists. And it will grow. It will grow because ideas are moving much faster now across borders, across cultures, and the young people are plugged in. And therefore, that is what I meant, that... Uh, we could do a small part to contribute to new modes of engagement. Yeah. New ways in which differences in views can be aired, shared, and which is actually constructive for society as a whole, that we have a diversity of views about issues that are presented with intellectual honesty, yeah. that we all don't and will not be able to agree on most. And yet, we should be able to do this without creating conflict and advers adversarial types of behavior. Because in the end, all of us are interested in moving things forward. And I think this engagement is going to be very critical. Mm -hmm. And if you can do things that will allow us to engage, in a sense, in a more positive way, if I can call it that, 
then this will be much better for the future. Okay, on that positive note, let's throw it open to the floor. Questions, comments, but no speeches, please. All right. Uh, yes, sir. And I saw a hand go up there. Whose hand was it? Yep. Your hand? Okay. Any other hand? Okay, good. My name is Tan Si Peng, graduate of the University of Malaya. I just want to bring upon the critical mind. As Asians, we were brought up to respect the teachers and so on. We don't want to offend the teacher because we want to get good grades from them. And also, we don't want to embarrass the teacher. If you ask some question which the teacher cannot answer, then what will happen, right? Therefore, I was thinking whether we should cultivate the sense of curiosity that you should say, anybody who come across two plus two equal to four, why can't you say, can it be five or six or something like that? That means you have a curiosity to explore. So I have a feeling our discipline and all that is organized in the wrong way. If you study economics, you know nothing but dollars and cents and all the economic value. You study science, chemistry, all that you learn. Physics, all that. All this brought to my mind when my son enrolled for computer science. And they put down the faculty, it's not art science or anything, but interdisciplinary studies. That means you have a bit of this, this, and that. You have a physics, how to the matter heat up and so on, then all sort of computing and so on all coming together. So I was thinking, instead of our pure study where you come in, study economics, chemistry, physics, and so on, whether we should have a holistic approach. That means even if we study economics, can you apply your economic principle to other sphere? Yeah rather than just pure so economic you, and nothing really more. you're referring to yeah. uh, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary yeah, yeah. approach. Yeah. yeah, so that you have a more holistic mind. Great, got it. Okay, yeah. okay. thank you. Okay. And I think you make two very good points. I think the first is that the nature of the interaction between the teacher and the student has to change. And uh, recently I visited our faculty of engineering and they started a new program called the design-centric curriculum or program. And what it involves is the students uh, do projects which uh, may cross different disciplines and then they present them to the professors. And this also meant that the professors were now going into areas where they're not the domain experts. Because if I'm a civil engineer but my student is doing a project that is largely electrical engineering plus design, I'm outside of my domain expertise. And uh, the very interesting observation which the dean made to me was that it changed the nature of the relationship between the student and the professor. The students soon found out that the professors didn't know much more than them in that topic. And they were therefore actually became a lot more confident, asked much better questions, and had much better level of engagement. Of course, the professors were not really entirely comfortable at the beginning outside the comfort zone, but I think over time it will make them better teachers. So the point you make is correct, and that's why I think that a very fundamental challenge that we have to address is to change the mindset of not just the students, but the teachers. But we have to do this over time, because we do know now that every time you give a lecture, someone is actually checking to see whether what you're saying is factually correct. And so this asymmetry in knowledge, in information, is much less. But it does not mean, though, that just because you can use a Google very well, that you are as smart as your professor. Because understanding a topic requires a much broader appreciation of many other types of information. What I refer to as the scaffolding of information upon which a particular piece of information hangs. And unless you are able to master that scaffolding, you may perceive different bits of information, but you don't quite understand how they interrelate. And that's why, going to your point about breath, you need that depth so that you won't be flitting around superficially between topics, but you need that breath, that scaffolding of knowledge 
so that as new things come up, you're able to categorize them, place them, interpret them, and see how they connect to existing knowledge. And it's that combination of breadth and depth that is what we are trying to achieve. Thank you. Val, introduce yourself. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Valerie. And while you were watching the show today, um, I've been online on the online chat. And a few, uh, there are a couple of questions that been, have been left on the chat and on the website. So I'm going to ask a question here from username AU. It's a bit of a macro question, but I think it's related to what we're talking about today. So uh, this user asked, how much do university rankings matter to NUS? Uh, he or she seems to think there's a lot of press coverage on this issue and would like to hear your thoughts. So first, I must say that all of us pay attention to it because everyone else pays attention to it. And uh, so we do follow what happens uh, and we take the opportunity to look at the component parts, the criteria of different types of rankings to help us to have a sense of how we're doing in different areas and where we could improve. But we do not shape our strategy based on rankings. We shape our strategy based on what we think will really bring value to our community, to our students, and to our university. And if uh, by so doing, we go do well in the rankings, that's good. But should there be a situation where the strategies we pursue perhaps end up with us reducing our rankings. I think it's something we have to accept. I want to make a further point, which is that we have to be careful about the way the rankings are set up. Because they could also enforce a view, a general perception, that there's only one type of successful university. And that is a highly international, research-intensive university. But we know that that cannot be so, particularly for large countries with big university systems, where you, in fact, need a much more differentiated types of universities. Some are community colleges, liberal arts colleges, special technical schools, research-intensive universities. So I think as we look at rankings, we must also consider that they do not, we must be careful that they do not lead us to mentally think that there's only one type of success, one model that's applicable to all universities, and that's a research-intensive model. Oh, Prof Tan. <laughs> yes. You asked whether we are ready for the future, and your very first proposition is that knowledge is all the time being commoditized. We live in a very dangerous world if everything is commoditized. Uh, the present current uh, series of uh, the television uh, in, on, on, on our channel News Asia on money, power, and the Wall Street. I think most of us have seen that. That's the very dark side of the use of knowledge which is commodified. And then you have Lance Armstrong. All that. There's a sort of corruption that's going on amongst the top elite in society. And that's where the most fearful thing there is about the future. And this is the dark part of the future. All the critical minds can be spread across a whole spectrum unless they come from a single seminary or monastery with one cast of mind. You have a school of critical thinkers, but there can be a whole spectrum of people with or without a very basic moral foundation. Not only moral foundation, understanding of different cultural uh, uh, differences, ability to to see all sides of a question. Of course, this is all part of critical thinking itself. But basically, the moral foundation must be there. And critical thinking alone, without this basic moral foundation. And I would add, as he says, curiosity. 
Because the word curiosity and the word care come from the same root word, the same Greek root word. Curiosity involves care as well. So a critical mind must be curious, and that curiosity must include a caring disposition. And a critical mind by itself can be a dangerous mind without these foundations. Well, I think that's Thank a you. very good point. Yeah. After the uh, global financial crisis, uh, some of our board members asked us, why don't we teach values in business school? <laughs> Not monetary values, you know, social values, <laughs> in the personal values. And so we had a very interesting discussion, uh, which I might summarize in the following way. That first, there are some values, of course, that we hold very sacred as an academic institution. Values of intellectual honesty, integrity, because they're very fundamental. But there are other situations where it may not be possible to teach a universal set of values. But what we can do is to help every student to develop a certain sense of self-introspection, of looking at issues, of taking a step backwards, of understanding who they are, where they are, or why they behave in certain circumstances, how does the environment shape their behavior. That certain sense of self-awareness, I would consider as an important part of a person's general education. And if we are able, through that, to raise awareness amongst individuals of where value-laden assumptions and judgments are being made, that would be an important first step towards individuals working out for themselves how they ought to behave in certain situations. Let me maybe uh, give a, a, te a somewhat tangential example. I, personally, I, I was uh, quite influenced by a panel discussion I participated in in uh, Hawaii many years ago, which was uh, about a, this was a bioethics conference, the title of which was Medically Right, Ethically Wrong. And to cut a long story short, there's a US patient, had a very gangrenous leg, doctor said, you must take it off, otherwise you die. The patient said, no, I won't do it. But when he became unconscious, the family went to the doctors and said, please take off the leg. They did. He did very well. The question to the panel was, was this medically right but ethically wrong? And uh, the first speaker, the first panelist was from US said, well, you are wrong. Medically, you are, you are ethically wrong because the individual said he did not want it and you took off his leg. Whereas, I was an Asian panelist and I said, in Asia, in fact, if you didn't ask the family, you, might be, you would be wrong. Because in Asia, particularly amongst elderly, in that time many years ago, the unit of autonomy was not the individual, it was the family. So, the point I'm trying to make with this rather long example is that there are many assumptions, some assumed values that might not even, we may not even be conscious of. And they influence the way we think about things. And so I think a very important first step is raising individuals' awareness to where they're coming up against issues of values. And then exactly what kind of values they develop, I think the university can play a role in helping to present ideas to help shape this. And so will the environment in which the individual grows up in, operates. But in the end, I think that hopefully will allow us to shape individuals who are aware of themselves, of where value judgments are, and are able to behave responsibly. And uh, in this regard, if I could just finish off this point, that I think community engagement is a very important part of this. Because it's only really through community engagement that individuals, that students, actually come across real issues. And as they go through this, and when they come back and talk about it with their peers and the professors, I think that's where they actually get a deeper understanding 
of social values at work and how they themselves would play this out. So in summary, I think there are uh, values which all of us uphold, uh, not killing people, not cheating, integrity, and so on. But beyond these, I think that it's very important for us to actually help individuals to realize and to work out how they would actually look at issues and to consider how's the best way for them to behave. So, so George Wan, that, that was actually a very instructive um, example that you gave, you know, the, the, the Hawaii uh, panel session. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, ethical dilemmas that decision makers down the road would have to face. And the question really is, how does the university, uh, how does the university imbue this sense of critical thinking, critical judgment in the, in the, in, in the four, five, six years that the <coughs> students are here. Uh, clearly, we don't have a structured program, and I think that's a good thing. We don't have a structured program. But how, can you give us some examples of how this is actually done? I think the first thing is that you need a diverse community. You need a community where there are diversity of views, diversity of perspectives, diversity of backgrounds, so that you have individuals who would be able to tell you things that will lead to the mini aha, yes, that's it, you know. So first you must have a diverse community. And then you must uh, find ways to bring that diverse community into dialogue around issues where these things could surface. So I see Taeyong here. Uh, one of the things in the university town residential colleges is creating this seminar style setting where students from very diverse backgrounds have to research issues, discuss issues, some of which will be technical, but where there will also be these social, cultural, value related questions. Sorry, when you say diverse background, are you talking about socioeconomic class diversity or ethnic or citizenship diversity? Uh, all of the above. Or all of disciplines? The above. All, all of the above. So you have students from different disciplines, yeah. different backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, students from overseas talking together about topics. So if we look at the issue of, say, environmental sustainability, right, it's very easy for us to uh, take a formulaic approach and say the way to do it is, well, you know, stop cutting down trees and, you know, uh, uh, cap, uh, you know, growth and so on. But if you were from a country which was just emerging, just developing, your perspectives will be very different. So whose values should prevail? How do we resolve this apparent differences in perspective needs? And I think it has to start by a, a deeper understanding of the contexts within which people behave and think, right? So creating a diversity, as diverse a community as you can on campus, is a very important starting point. And then bringing that diverse group in a more formal way to talk about academic issues creates the platforms where the students would actually be able to examine this. I think another very powerful way of, under, of understanding values is uh, through experiential learning, where students go out and do things in the community or do difficult things, sports, challenge themselves. I think what is lacking in our system today, which we are building up, is after you've engaged in those activities, to have that self-reflection, that, that sharing, maybe conversations with more senior people, mentors, help you to organize your thinking, help draw out what are the major learning points personally and from the value system point of view, and allow you to use those things to shape your thinking for the future. So this is something that we have to work on, but I think the foundation really is a stimulus. The starting point is a stimulus. And the creation of natural opportunities for individuals to discover these things for themselves. And I, guess, I guess the point that Harry made is really about you know, the, the general concern that we are having 
yeah. you know, globally, not just in Singapore, that brilliance without character can be a dangerous thing. And we have enough evidence of that you know, um, around us. And I think tertiary institutions have a particular responsibility to be, I mean, being the last, the last bastion, so to speak, like to hold it back, whether you can reverse certain trends. You know. Could you give a quick take on how you are addressing that very, uh, very tough responsibility? No, I mean, I think you are the final, yeah. formal level of influence. I, 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 I don't think we are the final, formal, because it is the, really the whole way economic and financial incentives are structured. It's the way that um, society, what society chooses to uphold, to celebrate, you know, that sets the frame that conditions a lot of ways in which people behave. And you can uh, do a fantastic job in a university and training certain value systems when you enter into a world where value systems and incentives are so different. Uh, you know, people will reshape their values. Values change over time. I mean, they're not constant. So, yes, we have to put a strong focus on understanding the value and social impact of what we do in our work. So, economic growth, but with inclusive, sustainable, with inclusive and sustainable models. Ways in which we can ensure that we don't single-mindedly do things with the exclusion of consideration of their social and sustainability related types of consequences. But there's also a, another discussion, which is really at an academic and scholarship level, which is really about the way we set up our systems of reward, of uh, the things that we celebrate. And in fact, I think many signs of this are already happening, that young people today, at least I've been in some forums where young people question business leaders that beyond making profits, what is the value they're creating for mm -hmm. society? What is the good that they're bringing? Not just generating financial gains for some parts of the population, but as part of their <coughs> business, yeah. they must be creating value for others as well. So I think that we are, we are starting to see, as a result of the and financial these crisis, are emerging. these questions yeah. are emerging. And we too have a role to play in contributing to thinking and to discussion about this. And in time to come, hopefully we'll be able to shape a much more balanced approach to these things. Thank you. Yes. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Hui. I um, recently graduated from NUS. Um, I have a question for you. Um, as a university level policy maker, um, and as, as I can see that uh, we are moving toward the more intangible values like curiosity or you know, creativity, how do you effectively measure this, you know, this you know, effectiveness of this policy? Like, do we look at data or do we look at what kind of things do you look at? So your question, just to make sure we understand it, is, is there a way we can measure whether there has been some effective shift in behavior or character because of these interventions in the soft areas? Is that what you're saying? Within the university. Within like, the university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a way in which you... Or could you share a specific example, what kind of data, what kind of you know, things you look at to derive a certain decisions? Yeah, I think that's a very important question. It's also a very difficult thing to, to do. So I think, first of all, uh, we have to start by being clear about our educational goals. And uh, so a lot of work is being done to try to define this carefully. And then to see how the way we design our programs and the way we set up the examinations reflect and reinforce those goals. I think that is the first and important step. And uh, as an intermediate type of uh, process indicator, we can actually get external visiting groups to come and look at our programs and to give us the analysis and the evaluation of how well we're doing. So in fact, every department in NUS 
has a visiting committee come once every five years, and they look at the way the programs are, are, are set up and how they contribute towards or don't contribute towards the stated goals. But that is a, a process indicator. We also do um, studies, longitudinal studies, to look at the impact of some of our special programs. For, so, for example, as part of the university town residential colleges, uh, we are starting uh, educational outcome types of studies to see whether in the longer term the desired learning outcomes that we had envisioned are being achieved by the students as reported by them and by how they perform. Embedded in that, uh, we could also look at uh, some slightly more qualitative measures like how do they rate the way they appreciate, they can deal with, and the level of comfort and effectiveness when engaging students uh, from other countries, from other cultures, from other disciplines. Again, this is self-reported, but I think it's quite a, a, a useful marker for how students perceive the value of that. Then, of course, I think the real test is uh, what happens when these students graduate and go out into the world. Uh, and there, what we can use is uh, the reported looking back what has been the important things, the important programs for them. And uh, this applies more easily to academic programs. It, of course, is much harder when you talk about issues of uh, character building, culture, and so on. But I think these are things that uh, we can some, get some sense of uh, through surveys. And finally, we also want to see qualitatively what are some examples of our graduates making an impact in different sectors that reflect the gaining of these values. Now, but Joshua, I hear you say we can. So, are you saying that it's not something we do? We do. Uh, we do maybe half or two thirds of what I've described. But, but you have got plans to. You but hope to be able to. Do we more. hope to be able because uh, the whole area of trying to uh, measure these much more intangible things is uh, the validity of the things that you can measure. So, I think we need to have a combination of survey-based data as well as much more quality data to get a sense of where we are. But at the end of the day, I, I think that uh, we need to take all these different sets of inputs as well as our own qualitative feedback from alumni, from within the community, and just have a general sense of uh, whether we are effectively making a transition. Okay. We have time for, at the most, two more questions, but those of you who didn't get a, a chance to ask a question here, you can ambush him later. Yeah. One from you. Uh, Val, I think you'll have to... Is there a burning question from someone, a netizen? Yeah. No. Uh, yourself, the man in uh, blue, blue shirt? Yes. Was there a hand somewhere here? No? Okay. So after that, Val, and then we wrap. Yes. Good evening, uh, Prof Tan. I'm uh, Thomas Lee. I'm graduated from NUS in 1995. Uh, my question is that um, is the knowledge of risk management, for example, in the field of risk management in medicine, risk management in corporate management, is this knowledge uh, enough to nurture a critical mind to prepare NUS student for the future? especially a future when Asia plays an important role. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I uh, wouldn't say that we have a formal program in risk management uh, across the university. Um, what are the things that we think are very important that every NUS student we feel should have exposure to them? I think one of them is uh, critical thinking and writing skills. So one of the programs that the provost is really pushing out uh, 
in two years' time, nearly all NUS students will have enrolled in critical thinking and writing programs. And we think that's very important. Um, second really link to that is communication skills. The third is an area that uh, the provost has been working on, which is really about being prepared for the future in terms of uh, career preparation, development, understanding and preparing early for the types of job opportunities you want to pursue. Then in the pipeline, so these are things that we're really doing. In the pipeline, we also want to um, relook at the whole area of quantitative skills. Of course, today in our university, there are disciplines which already have very heavy focus on quantitative skills, right? Mathematics, engineering, science. There are um, programs where the emphasis is not as strong. But given the nature of uh, the types of questions and problems that our graduates will face, having a sufficiently strong base in quantitative science, mathematics, statistics, will be very important for the future. So this is something that we are studying and looking to see how we would implement and the scale at which we'll do this. Now, I, I can see that maybe embedded in that, there could be some elements of risk management, uh, but uh, risk management as a topic does not appear uh, as, as, as a program that crosses all, all disciplines. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Hello. Hi. Okay. So we have another question here from uh, Mr. Yo King Jun, who couldn't be here tonight and is logging in from India. Uh, so he asks, Prof What's Tan. What's his name again? Yo King Jun. I think King you know Jun. him. King Jun. Yeah. Yes. Our King Jun. Okay. Such <laughs> so a kipo. A personal question for Prof Tan. Prof Tan, you epitomize a walking example of someone who has impressive multidisciplinary skills. Given that you were trained as a medical doctor, what tips and advice can you give us on how we can emulate you and how you have come to this capacity? <laughs> Capability, can, sorry. Can we tell King Ju to go easy on the sucking up? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So King Ju and I, uh, uh, thank you for the question. I, uh, some of you may know I gave a talk once at Center for the Arts and uh, so one parent raised her hand and said, you know, um, you must have a very supportive parents who, you know, made you do all these things and then, you know, made you very well-rounded. And I said that, in fact, uh, I had very protective parents. So as a child, I uh, had to learn how to swim by in secret, how to cycle in secret, you know, and wasn't supposed to do all these things, right? So I came from a, a background where, in fact, uh, you know, um, the horizons of my exposure were very limited. And it was really in university that I had my real chance to be exposed to a much, much broader range of uh, opportunities, uh, particularly staying in the hall of residence. And luckily for me, the opportunities came and I took them, right? Uh, I took them. And they actually led me down many paths. Uh, and soon I actually was uh, finding myself interested in so many things. And from uh, art to you know, uh, physical sports, to travel, culture, biology, biodiversity. So that it just opened up the whole world. And this was in the 1980s. So I'm a strong believer that regardless of your background, of what you were before, the university can provide that space, those opportunities for you to really explore and find yourself. And I was lucky that maybe I was more interested in many things and therefore I became a jack of all trades. I actually am not very good in anything, but I enjoy and do a lot of things. Other people will 
find fulfillment in other things. And so we should not try to prescribe single routes or single opportunities because all our students are different and we have many students. So within NUS, our philosophy has been to try to create an environment where there are many pathways so that students can self-select, they can choose, they can explore, and in the process, find and develop themselves. Not just in terms of their minds, but in terms of their person. And one final thing I would say is very important, and that is the company I kept. Because in university, I met many really brilliant people, right? All the top students in my class were all from Malaysia. You know. <laughs> uh, and uh, we spent many hours, of course, uh, sparring with each other in academic subjects, but we also spent endless nights talking about uh, existentialist writings, about the world, about politics, about philosophy. And those were so valuable in exposing me to things which are really quite foreign, right? And they were done naturally. There was no compulsion. So I think it's, it's, it's the combination of that space, that environment, that empowerment of the individual that really matters. So we have to try and create that. And I would add one final point, that in some ways we have to try to urge strongly encourage our students to take full advantage of the opportunities. And that was actually, parenthetically, amongst other reasons, one of the reasons why in medical school, um, the students don't get graded for the first year, so that they were freed from the need to compete relentlessly for grades, which, after some time, don't actually matter anymore. And hopefully they'll have more time to collaborate, to learn together, and hopefully to be able to develop themselves as individuals. Prof, Prof can I add one more comment? I think in this fast, rapid world, the ever constant is change. But of course, the bugbear is that if the speed is too fast, then all of us cannot cope with it. So I was thinking whether universities should teach the student how to handle change, particularly the very rapid change. Do you think that should be part of your curriculum? It's a very good point. I, I think we should do it, but it should not be part of the curriculum. It should be part of what I call exposing through experiential learning students to situations where they are almost overwhelmed because there are so many things happening and they're not quite in control. For myself, uh, it happens when I travel, when I do things, uh, when I get exposed to multiple deadlines, you know, when you almost feel out of control. And that's when, if you have uh, some degree of self-introspection, some advice from people who are wise, that you learn how to develop this quality of stillness at a core stillness at a core. In other words, uh, how do you keep yourself still and calm at your core, even as things are madly switching around you? And it can be learned, it can be done. But it can only be learned experientially. But if you can learn it, if you can master it, you build on it, then you'll be a much more self-efficacious person because you'll be able to deal better with adversity, change, uncertainty. And maybe I'd like to just finish off with an anecdote, right? That, as some of you know, I also learned Chinese painting in the traditional way. And I enrolled in a very traditional class, you know? One month, you learn how to paint one tree trunk, you know? Next month, you paint two tree trunks. Third month, you paint two tree trunks with leaves, you know? Fourth month, you paint one rock, two rocks, three rocks, you know. But I want to make two points about what this experience taught me. One was that 
This is all very hard work, painting one tree trunk, two tree trunks. But that discipline, that control of the brush that you learn, actually liberates you so that once you can master it, you can be freed from it. And that mastery then allows, gives your creativity greater expression. It goes back to this idea of road learning, road rigor, that that actually prepares you to be able to be more creative. And the second thing was, uh, when I first started painting lessons, if I had a bad day in the office, which is many days, <laughs> the painting would be terrible, right? You know, lots of discarded paper. But after some time, I found that when I started painting, it started to calm my mind. And then the paintings were less awful. And so it's possible for you to either through an act of external neutral action or activity or through whatever other means, learn how to be still at the center even as the mad world swirls around you. And again, this will be incredibly valuable for our students if they can learn it. And the only way we can do it is to create opportunities for them to find out for themselves. I think that's a wonderful point to end the conversation. One of the, I remember some time back, was it about uh, a year back when I asked you if your hair is really black? You know, it's, it's, it's quite disgusting because we are same age and um, I don't die, neither does he and I was quite sure he, he died uh, and, and it says a lot about the person who is the president of NUS. If there's one word that comes to mind, if I have to use to describe Cho Chuan, it's equanimity, balance. Calm, almost zen, but short of levitation. <laughs> I think he has the capacity, as he said, to find that, that stillness, that center, listens and takes his responsibility of having to make a decision in the end very seriously. Because he understands that his decision can have very serious and long-term consequences on a lot of people. And I must say that if there is a Renaissance man that I've met, this is a man. <laughs> We've had some great conversations about Shakespeare, about poetry, about art, about quantum physics, and a whole range of things. And the reason why we are all fortunate is that we have a man who is prepared to listen and who is prepared to hear us out at a time when we are all in a hurry to make decisions. I think NUS is fortunate and I think we are all exceptionally proud to have the ability to say, Professor Tan Cho Chuan is an alumnus of NUS. Please join me. Very kind. And of course, he paid me quite a bit to say that. <laughs> uh, I would like to present something to you. Yeah? Okay. On behalf of the organizers, here's a picture of you and me. Oh, well done. <laughs> Looks quite black, your hair. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my hair looks quite black. I think there's some. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is from us to you. And uh, You Alive would not have happened if not for Cha Chuan's support and patronage. Uh, we thank you for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And here's this being the first session of the third season. This is the third year, by the way, of You Alive. Um, say something nice about us, <laughs> in particular me. <laughs> Thank you.
He's definitely a doctor. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you, you got to read it yourself. NUS, ever ready for the future, and really, you are alive. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joshua. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, we've got some refreshments. May I invite the first uh, couple of rows out for a while? And then the rest of you can follow. They're Singapore style. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for joining yeah, us. Right.